Well, I'm glad to be here. Y'all glad to be here today? I said just a minute ago that um, when we consider that it's race weekend in Martinsville and people are, I, I, I drove by and you, you've probably seen it before, but imagine the, the traffic just coming onto the, the 220 exit, I mean, yeah, the 220 exit off of the bypass there on the other side, on the, uh, the eastbound lanes of it. And honestly, I don't get it. Now, some of you might, I don't. Uh, but I would rather be right here than anywhere else. Hey, I like to go to baseball games, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make it priority for me on Sunday. I believe I told you once before, I'm getting ready to get the deer stand, but it's not gonna be on a Sunday morning. And lo and behold, y'all might know next weekend is muzzleloader season, and guess where I'm gonna be on drill weekend. So I can't be in the deer stand next Saturday, but uh, I guarantee you I will be the next week. But it's not going to take the place of my worship on Sunday. 1 Peter chapter number 1, if you turn with me there this morning. <clears throat> A couple of weeks ago, the church that my parents attend, uh, Brush Arbor Baptist Church in Danville, had their homecoming and a few, week, a few nights of revival that week, and former pastor Steve Lamb came and uh, provided the messages for that homecoming and revival. And I was on reserve duty that weekend, too, so I wasn't able to go. Uh, I would have liked to because Pastor Steve, of course, was my pastor there during my youth, and I certainly would have enjoyed seeing him. He pastors uh, somewhere in Florida now. But uh, I, I got the chance, though, through the blessing of YouTube to be able to check out that message, and uh, what a wonderful thing. Now, by the way, YouTube and Facebook... Awesome tools for outreach, awesome tools for folks that might be sick or they might uh, be shut in and not able to come to church. Never, never, never should they be substitutes for in-person worship. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, we, we, we read, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What does that tell me? That tells me as long as I'm able to, I'm not sick, I'm not infirm, anything like that, I need to be in, in the house of God. And... Um, uh, over the last few years, everybody uh, seems to be of the mindset that being online is just as good as being in person. And no, that's not the case, And uh, which is why I'm so glad that uh, you folks are here this morning. Instead of catching me later on this week when I put the, <laughs> when I put the message on YouTube and stuff like that. But, um, but no, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad to be able to, uh, to get those worship services. I've told y'all before I listen to preaching more in the car during the day than I do anything else and uh, that gives me a boost and gives me some uplift and sometimes it'll give me a little bit of an idea on what to preach on Sunday and so you're getting that today. Uh, Pastor Steve, he preached from this passage. Now I'm not giving you his message, all right? Uh, I'm not plagiarizing him because I'm not as, uh, I don't have the charisma that he has and i um, the points, I listened to it again this morning, the points that he made are going to be different than the points that I make. So uh, you're not getting a rerun. But uh, I am uh, praying that uh, as we look to this passage today that we will be uh, doubly blessed and uh, we definitely get some encouragement. Because we need encouragement, don't we? There are difficult days and, and we need encouragement. And we're coming up on the holiday season too and... Um, you know, it's a foregone conclusion. People, people need that encouragement, especially when they come into this time of the year. And I want to be an encourager for you today, and I pray that through the Holy Spirit we will be encouraged. So 1 Peter chapter number 1, I'd ask as uh, we customarily do, if you'll stand with me as you're able, that we can honor God's word as we read this morning. 1 Peter chapter number 1, we're going to be preaching from verses 1 through 9. The Word of God says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, 
ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now if for a season, if need be, your unheaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. I want to ask if you would look back at verse number four. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day of worship. And Lord, now as we look to your word, as we seek the teaching that you have, as we seek the encouragement that you have for us today, may you bless. May your spirit move among us. May you speak to us. Lord, if there's a need of conviction, will you convict us? Where there's a need of challenge, Lord, will you challenge us? Lord, over and above, may we bring you honor and glory through, through the hearing of your word, through the hearing of the preaching of your word. And Lord, may you lift us up. And then when we leave this building today, we will go out of here uh, with a, a newness of our faith, a newness of our love for you and the encouragement that you provide. And we can share that amongst the world that we live in, Lord. We thank you. We, we pray all these things in Christ's name. And the church said... Amen and amen. So in the times that we've spent together, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you to be seated, but y'all be seated. In the times that we spent together, I think you all know my stand and my burden for the church and how I pray that we all as the church will return to our faith, will return to our worship, will return to our calling. There's a lot of discouragement, I said just a minute ago, in the world that we live in today. A lot of things that tend to stoke our fears. And um, remember in a previous message, I told you that faith and fear can't live in the same plane in space. They're, they're mutually exclusive. They cannot coexist. And sometimes we'll be tempted um, to act on those fears. And they'll let them keep, we'll let them keep uh, us from where God wants us to be. There's many things out there that would cause us to throw up our hands in defeat and feel like we're, we're all alone. I'm sure Jeremiah might have felt that way. Remember last week we talked about Jeremiah and how he stood alone proclaiming God's truth to a nation that had gone against God's teachings. We see the difficulties and the wickedness in the world around us in such a light that it looks like, uh, it looks like we... The world is winning. You know, bad news sells. Good news, it don't sell, does it? Good news don't sell subscriptions. It doesn't sell uh, ad time, none of those things. But, but, but good, uh, bad news sells, and we see it all around us, and, and it looks like the world is winning. And in the midst of all of that, we may be tempted to say to ourselves, where's the hope? You know, the other night... Um, me and my pastor and his wife, we were talking, and, and uh, our pastor's wife, she leads the youth group at our church, uh, teaches the youth Sunday school, leads youth on Wednesday night, and um, thank God she has a burden to help our youth understand that, yes, they might have to live in the world, but they don't have to be of the world. And um, so we were talking about some of the nonsense that's going on in one of the schools um, in our area, sad to say, the school that I graduated from. And um, I don't know how true this is because I hadn't seen it, but I'm not going to say that she'd make this up. But they're saying that, that there are kids in that school that are uh, declaring themselves to be animals instead of human beings. Folks, that's sick. And that kind of stuff is permeating what we see nowadays. We see things like that. We see people that can't decide what gender they are. Oh, by the way, there are only two genders. Can I get a witness? Uh, you read the book of Genesis, and in 15 seconds flat, you can figure out that there are two genders. Don't get me on that rant. But I'm saying all this to say we see these things going on. We see this permeating the newspapers. We see this permeating everything that we look at, and it's of such, a, it's of such intensity. And it looks like those of us on the side of righteousness are in the minority. It looks like we don't mean anything anymore. It would easily be a good idea for us to throw up our hands and say, where's the hope? What on earth 
are we doing this for? But I'm glad to tell you today, people of God, we do have hope. You recall there at the end of September when we got the remnants of the hurricane? Uh, I myself haven't seen wind like that in quite a few years. I was stationed in Oklahoma twice, right there in Tornado Alley. And uh, we saw some winds, of course. Thank God we didn't see any devastating tornadoes in our area during that time, but they definitely do happen out there. But before that, or excuse me, since then, I have not seen that type of wind that we had in the, in the remnants of the hurricane. But you know what? The storms are going to rage, aren't they? The storm rages, the night seems to have no end, and we say, or we tend to say, where's the hope? Y'all ever been sick in the middle of the night and it feels like daylight is just never going to come? And you might say to yourself, where's the hope? When we're battered from all sides by bad news, bad reports, injury, illness, loss, we have the tendency to say, where's the hope? I have good news for you. My hope is built on nothing less. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Folks, we have hope. And as we look to our text today, my prayer is that we'll be reminded as Christians that there may be difficulties, and there always will be, but we have hope. You're saved today. You've been sanctified, justified, declared righteous by the shed blood of Christ. You have hope. So today I want to point out just one of the many rays of hope that we have when we belong to Christ, the hope of of heaven. It was providential that we sang when we all get to heaven. Y'all didn't know that's what I'm going to preach on today. See, that's providence. That's not coincidence. That's providence. I know we all think to ourselves about the glory of heaven. And you know, we see many futile attempts to put a picture to heaven. You've seen it, I'm sure. And in the movies and television and cartoons, they all have this picture of what heaven might look like. But I submit to you, we cannot fathom the beauty and the perfection of heaven. We who live in this area know the beauty of the fall. We see it all around us, even on this parking lot. What beautiful trees we have surrounding us. And they have such beautiful colors this time of year. And I was up on the mountain on Friday, and uh, they've not quite peaked yet. They're getting there, but they've not quite got there yet. So they're still very, very beautiful up there. You know, I was stationed in Hawaii for three years, and you might look at me and get envious when I say something like that, but uh, it gets old after about 18 months. I'll just put it to you that way. But it's a beautiful place, and anyone who sees that or any other beautiful place and, and doubts the truth of a divine creator needs a psychiatrist. There are definitely some beautiful sights that we see in our world. They don't compare to the beauty that is in heaven. Folks, we can picture all kinds of beauty. But like I said, it does not measure up to how beautiful heaven is. Listen to what John the Revelator tells us in Revelation chapter number 22. You don't have to turn there, uh, but just kind of mark it down and look at it later. But I'm just going to read to you from ver uh, excuse me, chapter 21, a couple of verses, and then chapter 22, a couple of verses, just to show you a glimpse of what John the Revelator saw. He says in uh, chapter 21, verse 18, And the building of the wall, wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third caldocne, I don't know how you say that, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrys... Chrysopolis, I don't know if we say that either. The eleventh of Jason, the twelfth and Amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold as if it was transparent glass. Imagine 
what John the Revelator saw. We can't imagine that. We've probably seen those different types of jewels, but we can't imagine a city like that. And then in chapter 22, John says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the street, there, were, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Oh, boy, aren't you glad about that? Those things that we see around us, the effects of the curse, hey, there's a place where there is no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on, this, on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. A minute ago I said, imagine those, those times when something happens, in the, and usually it is in the middle of the night. And we wonder, is the daylight ever going to come? Well, we know in heaven there's no night there. They will need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, that was John the Revelator's futile attempt to describe what he saw there. But imagine such beauty. We can't fathom it. Oh, we can imagine. But we can't fathom it. So I ask you this morning, let's look to our text in 1 Peter. As we consider the hope of heaven that we have as children of God. And here's some truths that we learn from that passage that I know is intended to give us hope and I pray does give us hope in those dark days when the night seems to last forever, when we see things around us that baffle our imaginations. And you all are a little bit older than me, just a little bit, I'm not gonna insult you. You're a little bit older than me, you've seen better times. But now it seems like everything's going down the drain and where is the hope? Well, we have hope right here. So let's look at some things from this passage that give us hope. And the first is this. In Christ, we've been born again. Look at verse number three. Blessed be the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. We are born again. Each and every one of us had a physical birth. Each and every one of us had that day when we came to this earth as human beings. But you know Christ, you have that second birth like Christ talked about with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You are born again. Born into a better family. There's nothing wrong with our earthly families, hopefully. Most of them are okay, I guess. But we've been born into a perfect family. Imagine that, a perfect family. Thanksgiving's coming up. Y'all looking forward to being around some family members? But imagine a perfect family. But it goes further than that in verse number 3, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto what? A lively hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. What does that tell me right there? Because Christ rose from the dead, because he conquered death, we have hope. In Christ we've been born again. But let's go further, and this is why I wanted you to look again at verse number 4 when we was reading it to start with. Because, underline that, put an asterisk by it, put it in bold. Because we have new birth in Christ, we have an inheritance. Verse, uh, verse number four, to an inheritance. Man, isn't that awesome right there? You ever heard stories about people that made their money the old-fashioned way they inherited it? Y'all laugh at that. That was meant to be funny. <laughs> but each and every one of us have an inheritance. Me, I don't know if I'll ever have one. I may have been disowned. I hope, I hope not, but you never can tell. But we all have an inheritance if we belong to God through Christ Jesus. And there's more to it than that. I'm glad it doesn't end right there. But Peter tells us that it is an inheritance, first of all, incorruptible. Hey, I talked about the stuff that we see going on in the world around us right now. No doubt it is corrupt. You look at television, and I'm, I'm guilty of it, you, but you look at television, and you can see that nine times out of ten, it is, maybe nine and a half times out of ten, maybe more than that, it is corrupt. That's why in our house we always like to look at the old things. Andy Griffith, He the Knight, things of that nature. You say, He the Knight, someone usually gets murdered. Yeah, but it's still a good show. But our inheritance in Christ is in. 
corruptible. And that means more than just the fact that it's not corrupt. It means that it cannot be corrupted. You know, a minute ago, when we looked at what John the Revelator said, and he said there's no more curse, and we said that everything that we see around us is a result of the curse. It's a result of this world being corruptible. Anything that we have that we put our hands on is instantly corruptible. But oh, I sure am glad of the hope that we have in our inheritance in Jesus Christ because it is incorruptible. Even when we get there, we're not going to corrupt it. Aren't you glad about that? We're not going to corrupt an incorruptible hope, an incorruptible inheritance. But it goes further than that. It is undefiled, Peter tells us in, in verse number four. Not only is it incorruptible, not capable of being corrupted, it's also undefiled. It cannot be defiled. We see things going on in the world around us, and we see a lot of defilement. Anything that we can put our hands on, we have the capability to defile it. That's why we have people, kids, running around, can't figure out what gender they are. That's why we, we have kids that run around, can't, can't think of what, uh, what, what species they are. Because anything that we can put our hands into, we can defile it. But oh, we can't, we can't defile heaven. It's already undefiled. It's incapable of being defiled. But there's something else that I like that Peter tells us in, in verse number four. That fadeth not away. Man, imagine a place that is incorruptible, undefiled, and cannot fade away. You remember a minute ago I was talking to you about the inheritance that some people may get monetarily. You know, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, they pass away and they leave all their money. And that is, that is uh, corruptible, it is defilable, and it can pass away. Oh, but I got news for you. Our, our inheritance that we have in God through Jesus Christ, incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away. It's there. And we may, it may be a long time before we see it, but it's still there. And it's just as, it's just as pleasant now as it has been or ever will be because it's incorruptible, undefiled, and doesn't fade away. But what else does Peter tell us? It is reserved. It's reserved. You know, Christ today, that inheritance has been reserved. You know, I, I go on uh, drill, drill duty every, every month. I'll be going next weekend. And I'll go down, I'll go to South Carolina. And, you know, if I get promotable next summer, y'all pray with me that I find somewhere in Virginia that I can get, get to so I don't have to go so far. But in any case, I go to South Carolina, and I go down on Friday evening and stay Friday evening. That way I'm there Saturday morning. And so I'll reserve a room. And sometimes it's hard because people just love to come down there for some reason. But our inheritance is already reserved. We, you know the only thing that we have to do to make that reservation? Reach out in faith to Jesus Christ. And our reservation is made to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and doesn't fade away. And the only price that reservation cost was, was the blood of Christ. And he's already paid for that reservation. Aren't you glad about that? I have to pay for my reservation when I go on, on reserve duty. Now, they pay me back. They reimburse me. But I still have to pay. We don't have to pay. It's already been paid. You know, it reminds me of an illustration that I use a lot of time. And, you know, you have a house payment, you have a car payment. What would you think if you went to pay that one day and they said to you, it's already been paid? That's the image that we have when we consider our inheritance in heaven. It's incorruptible, it's undefiled, it doesn't fade away, and it is reserved. It's paid for. You don't have to do anything except believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, and that inheritance is yours. Why? Because when you know Christ, you've been born into his family. We talked a minute ago about inheritance that we may have 
here on earth. And we get that as a result of being born into the family that we're born into. It's the same picture. We're born into the family of Christ. So we have that inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away. It's reserved for us. It's paid for. We don't have to do anything except trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, that excites me today. In the midst of difficulty, that excites me. In the midst of the seemingly uh, unending night, that excites me. In the midst of craziness that we hear about or see, that excites me. And that encourages me. But not only do we consider that we're born again, not only do we consider that because we're born again, we have an inheritance, but number three, we are kept. Look at verse number five. Peter says, who are kept, when he says who, he talks about us, the, the, the church, Christians, those who've been born of God, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. We are kept. We are sealed. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Paul tells us, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know Christ today, you are sealed, you are kept, you are inheritors, you are born again. You are kept. Does that mean that God is, is going to uh, just decide he doesn't want you anymore? No, nope. you don't have to worry about that. You know, there are some people that sit in church pews, some this very Sunday morning, that think you can lose your salvation. God's not going to take away something he's given you as a gift. You're not going to lose that salvation. Now, that doesn't give us a license to do anything we want to do. You know, years ago, I was working, doing pest control. This is when I worked in Danville. And I went to do some apartments, and I don't know if you've ever worked pest control, but that is the, the hardest thing in the world is doing apartments. Believe me, I know what marijuana smells like. But I went to do uh, some apartments in Danville one time, and uh, it wasn't, it, well, they weren't bad apartments. They weren't the kind that you would smell marijuana in, but I've been in some of those. And there was a lady there, and by some, by some, way, shape, or form, she knew my granddaddy. Um, and I don't know if she'd ever met me. I couldn't remember it, but maybe she had at some point when I was with him. But anyway, she, she decided that it was, it was God's call on her life to tell me how in the Baptist church we think we can sin all week and come to church on Sunday and we're all good because we feel we've been sealed. You ever, have, you ever encounter anybody like that? And they don't care what you say to them. They don't care for you to explain your faith to them. They just know you go to the Baptist church so you think you're saved and you can just do anything you want to Monday through Saturday. Wrong answer. Yes, we're sealed. Yes, we're kept. That doesn't give us a license to blatantly sin Monday through Saturday and then come to church on Sunday and think it's okay like, like we're Catholic or something. But yes, we are kept. We are sealed. We are sealed by God's Holy Spirit, it tells us in Ephesians. And you know what? We can rejoice because of this. Verse number 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice. I'll give you context here. Where he says wherein or whatever your translation might say, it means because of all of this, all right? Inheritance incorruptible, undefiled faith is not a way reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Because of this, wherein you greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. You know what? We can rejoice because of our stance in the family of God. We can rejoice because we've been born again. We can rejoice that because of being born again, we have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, reserved. And then we can rejoice in all of this because we are kept, because we're sealed, because God's got us. We can rejoice, even in tribulation. Um, in the second part of verse number six, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And that, that'll preach right there, won't it? If ever we saw being um, in heaviness through manifold temptations it is now. But we can still rejoice because we have that inheritance. Even in tribulation, 
and even in trial, verse number 7, that the trial of your faith, and it's going to be tried, by the way. I talked to somebody, it's a couple weeks ago now, I guess, and it is the truth. Sometimes our faith will be tried. Sometimes our faith will be, will be shaken. If we need any proof of that, we can look around us. I talked about that a little while ago. These things test our faith. These things try our faith. But they need not break our faith. Why? Because we have that inheritance. Because we are kept. Because we have what God has promised us. You know Christ today, you are an inheritor. You're a victor, you're an inheritor, and you are kept. Even though your faith may, may be tried, Peter says, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Why? What does he say? Your faith is precious. Our faith in God is precious. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I love how Peter gives the analogy of gold there being refined. Gold being refined by fire. Our faith goes through the same refinement. Those of you here last week, you remember me talking from John chapter 15 about the, the apple orchard and how God is going to prune us. He's going to purge us so we can do what? Produce the best fruit. As they refine gold, so it'll look its best. And as our faith will be refined through the things that we go through, through the fires that we endure, through the things that we see around us, through things that might seem to discourage us, through things that might seem to make us throw up our hands and say, where is the hope? hope is that we have an inheritance. We are born of God. We are kept. But I love that uh, Peter doesn't stop with all of that. Tried with fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Hello, we're in church today. Why? Because we love Jesus. We haven't seen him, but we love him. We haven't seen him face to face, but we believe in him through the words of this book and through the, the presence of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. Whom having not seen you love, in whom that, though now you, you see him not yet believing. Hey, we don't see him, but we believe in him. You know, it's about, it's about asinine when you ever hear somebody that says he don't believe in the wind because he can't see it. But you sure do feel it, don't you? Whom having not seen you love, and in whom though we see, though now we see him not, believing we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hey, I've got joy because I believe in Christ. I have joy because I know that Jesus lives. I have joy because I know that Jesus has saved me. I have joy knowing that Jesus is still in the saving business. And because of that, we have an inheritance. And then he finishes up in verse number 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Basically, what's he saying there? He's saying that because of our faith, we're saved. Goes right around in that circle, don't it? Aren't you glad how, how these, these accounts will just go in a circle? Why is that? Because we continually need to be reminded. Why is that? Because we see things around us that take away our hope that make us discouraged, that make us, as I've said before, throw up our arms and say, what good is it? Because we need to be encouraged. We need to be lifted up. We need to be shown and re-shown and re-shown and re-shown the promise, the hope, the encouragement that we have through our faith in Jesus Christ. And folks, that's that's what it is right there. If you needed hope today, there's your hope. You know Christ, you have an inheritance. You needed hope today, there's your hope that you're born again. And because you're born again, you have that inheritance that's undefiled, that's incapable of being corrupted, that doesn't fade away, that's reserved. And there's the hope. There's the encouragement. Saying just a minute ago, as bad as I sing, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Where is our hope? It's in Jesus Christ, pure and simple. And that's the message that we carry amongst us 
as Christians. That's the message that we carry into the community that we live in. That's the message that we carry among the folks that we gather around. We have hope, and you can have it too. There are people that have, I don't want to say lost that hope, but have forgotten that hope. The things of the earth have gotten to them. They've bared down on their, on their shoulders, and they've forgotten that hope. It's our job to remind them of that hope. And so today, as we've gathered here and been re-reminded of that hope, May we take that hope, continue to remember that hope, continue to be encouraged in that hope, and encourage those around us in that hope. Let's pray.